Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and after we discuss the prevention and antibiotic prophylaxis for infective endocarditis, we are discussing today in our second video the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. First of all, what makes a patient predisposed to infective endocarditis? It doesn't occur normally in any structurally normal heart, but there are some specific factors that make the patient vulnerable for this type of infection. There are cardiac and non-cardiac factors. For example, a patient who had previously infective endocarditis is liable for recurrence. Patient with degenerative or rheumatic valvular heart disease. Patient with prostatic valves either surgical or transcatheter inserted. Patient with transvenous cardiac implantable electric device are very vulnerable to infection. And patients with congenital heart diseases. Non-cardiac factors like people who inject drugs are liable to tricuspid valve infective endocarditis. Patients with central venous or arterial catheter, the presence of this foreign body increases the risk for infection of the valve, especially tricuspid valve in case of central line. Immunosuppression like hematological diseases or sometimes patients who receive chemotherapy for cancer, recent dental or surgical procedure resulting in translocation of the oral microbes into the bloodstream, recent hospitalization, and of course the hemodialysis itself increase the risk for infective endocarditis. So a diagnosis of infective endocarditis should be considered in all patients with sepsis or persistent fever of unknown origin in the presence of one or more of these risk factors. It may present as acute, rapidly progressive infection with high probability for complication like in case of a staph aureus infection which is a very virulent organism, subacute or chronic disease with low grade or even no fever and non-specific symptoms like in case of the less virulent streptococcal infection or sometimes it presents for the first time with a complication especially the embolic complication and sometimes it is an atypical presentation in the elderly or immunocompromised. So the high suspicion for infective endocarditis is driven by a fever and positive plaque culture in absence of an alternative focus to explain the fever, especially when the patient has one or more risk factor, either cardiac or non-cardiac. Physical examination may reveal some clinical signs, but sometimes it is unremarkable and the absence of clinical signs like for example genuine lesion, ross spots or subconjunctival hemorrhage should not exclude infective endocarditis as their sensitivity and specificity are low. In the European Infective Endocarditis Registry, the incidence of fever in those patients was about 77.7%, .7%, so a minority of patients may be afebrile, especially elderly and immunocompromised. Cardiac murmur is present in 64.5, congestive heart failure, which is the most common complication, in 27.2, embolic complication in 25.3, cardiac conduction abnormality, which is common in aortic valve endocarditis due to its close proximity to the AV node in 11.5%. Vascular and immunological phenomena like splinter hemorrhage, ross spots, and glomerulonephritis are still common, but not as previously in the past. A high index of suspicion is essential in those patients who are predisposed with a low threshold to demand investigation in order to exclude or confirm the diagnosis and so avoid any delay in diagnosis, especially in high risk group. And it is important to inform those predisposed patients about the risk to develop infective endocarditis not to terrify them but in order to be aware if they develop any symptom like fever or new heart failure symptoms to ask for advice in the referral center to exclude infection so let's ask for the investigation first of all the basic lab we are going to ask for a blood picture to check hemoglobin and white cell counts. We are going to ask for biomarkers like CRP, which is high in any patient with inflammation, and procalcitonin, which is specific for sepsis. So we can use them as the initial diagnosis and also in the follow-up of the response to antibiotics. And markers of end-organ dysfunction, 
for risk stratification and estimating the severity of sepsis, but they are not specific, of course, like serum lactic acid, creatinine, bilirubin, platelet count, cardiac troponin, and natriuretic peptide. It's important to know that no biomarker has sufficient accuracy or specificity for infective endocarditis. Therefore, their main goal is to facilitate initial risk stratification and then monitor the response to antibiotic to show whether there is a fall in CRB or procalcitonin with antibiotics so the patient is improving or they are still the same or increasing so the patient show poor response. Then the microbiological investigation. Most of the cases would be blood culture positive infective endocarditis. So we need to take three sets of blood culture with 30 minutes interval and before the patient start antibiotic to avoid false negative results from a peripheral vein, not a central venous catheter. Each sample should contain 10 milliliter of blood to be incubated in both aerobic and anaerobic atmospheres. Use a meticulous trial technique when you withdraw the sample from the skin to avoid contamination with the skin flora. And in absence of previous antimicrobial therapy, this is virtually sufficient to identify the causative organism because it would be detected in these blood cultures. And we need to confirm that bacteremia is almost constant in patients with infective endocarditis. So no need to delay blood sample to coincide with the peaks of fever and nearly all blood culture are positive during bacteremia. So a single blood culture is not enough and it should be regarded cautiously to establish infective endocarditis diagnosis as we would need more diagnostic criteria to prove infective endocarditis. You should inform the microbiology lab that you are suspecting infective endocarditis. The automated machine or the gram staining can allow rapid identification in order to give the information to the clinician because you are going to start empirical antibiotic therapy after withdrawing the samples. But after you know the result, of the plaque culture rapidly through the gram stain, for example, you would modify your antibiotic therapy according to the detected organism. Then complete identification would be achieved with the current methodology, but sometimes it may require a longer time for fastidious or atypical organism. A minority of patients would be blood culture negative infective endocarditis in which no causative organism can be grown. So it doesn't mean that it is not caused by bacteria or any microbes. No, we couldn't reach the causative organism. And it is highly variable frequency with considerable, of course, diagnostic and therapeutic dilemma. The most common cause is previous antibiotic administration because you withdrawn the blood culture after the patient already received antibiotics. So in this case, you may need to withdraw the antibiotics and repeat blood cultures. But Make sure that the patient is stable with just subacute symptoms, not acute or rapidly progressive fracture. Patient has no evidence of local perivalvular or distant embolic complication, and he received just a very short course of antibiotics. In this case, stop antibiotics temporary and repeat blood cultures. The second cause is fungal infection or fastidious bacteria, which are notably obligatory intracellular bacteria requiring isolation in specialized media or serological tests specific for this organism like coxiella, partonella, mycoplasma, procella or legionella and specific PCR assay for example for trophorema, partonella, candida or aspergillus from the blood or the tissue. If you excluded any type of infection so you may suspect non-bacterial endocarditis which may be caused by immunological mechanism as in systemic lupus which sometimes may lead to endocarditis so you need to search for the anti-nuclear antibodies antiphospholipid syndrome so i would detect anti-cardiolipin antibodies or anti-pork antibodies in patients with porcine bioprostatic valves as sometimes the immune system attack this bioprocesses resulting in inflammation and fever but not caused by bacteria or fungi Please don't forget that if this patient undergone valve excision for valve replacement, in this case, that prosthetic or the native valve should be obtained at surgery and subjected to culture and histological examination to confirm what is the causative organism causing the direct infection 
on the valve. And of course, if the patient develops any embolic complication, for example, he has splenic infarction, and you arrange it for a splenectomy, this spleen should be subjected to pathological and culture in order to confirm or exclude the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. This diagram shows us how to deal with suspected endocarditis regarding blood cultures, whether they are positive or sometimes they are negative, so we may need to ask for serology or PCR or a specific cultural medium, and if we excluded any type of infection, so we can ask for serological test for anti-nuclear, antiphospholipid, or anti-pork antibodies. Then we are going for the imaging test. Of course, the first line is the echo, which is the key imaging technique to diagnose endocarditis and assess the structural and functional damage. And it would guide us for decision making and follow up the patient while receiving antibiotics. Of course, transthoracic it is the first line, but we need to know that it had low sensitivity but good specificity compared to transesophageal echo. But what makes transesophageal more privileged? It diagnoses perivalvular complication and small vegetation more accurate and more sensitive than transthoracic. Diagnose prosthetic valve endocarditis and any vegetation associated with cardiac implantable electric device. Patient with inconclusive transthoracic, of course, they need transesophageal to confirm the diagnosis. And patient with negative transthoracic, but you have a high clinical suspicion for infective endocarditis ask for transesophageal echo. In the echo, we should comment on the site of vegetation, whether it is on one valve or on multiple valves, its characteristic, whether it is mobile or non-mobile, sessile, filamentous, and the size, which is the maximum length of the vegetation. And of course, with the follow-up echo, we are following up the size of vegetation, whether it is increasing or decreasing. Any perivalvular complication like abscess, pseudoaneurysm, or dehiscence of prosthetic valve, intracardiac fistula, or leaflet perforation, because they are mechanical complications that, of course, this patient would need urgent surgery regardless of antibiotics because the antibiotics would not heal this mechanical damage. The repeat echo during follow up is essential in any uncomplicated infective endocarditis to detect new silent complication and, of course, monitor the vegetation size. Regarding the timing and modality of echo, it is not a fixed rule. It depends on the initial finding, type of microorganism, and the initial response to therapy. So, the recommendations for the echo that transthoracic is, of course, the first line imaging in any suspected infective endocarditis that you are going to ask for. Then, transthoracic echo in all patients with clinical suspicion of infective endocarditis, but the transthoracic is negative or non diagnostic. Undoubtedly, the patient needs transesophageal, and also in patients with clinical suspicion, in presence of prosthetic valve or intracardiac device, transesophageal echo is a must, and repeating echo, either transthoracic or transesophageal, is essential within 5 to 7 days if the first results were negative or inconclusive, but still the clinical suspicion is high, so repeat the echo after 5 to 7 days. Do we need to have transesophageal echo in patients with positive transthoracic? Yes, in case of left-sided infective endocarditis, in order to detect any perivalvular complications missed in the transthoracic, except in isolated right-sided native valve endocarditis with good quality image of transthoracic and unequivocal finding, in this case, you do not need transesophageal because, of course, right the side of the heart is an anterior structure. In this case, transthoracic would be more accurate than transesophageal. And in any patient with bacteremia caused by Staph aureus or Enterococcus faecalis or some species of Streptococci, class 2A to perform an echo because these organisms may be virulent enough to infect and colonize the valves. When you're following up a patient under medical therapy, as we mentioned, repeating echo is recommended as soon as a new complication is suspected, like new murmur, embolic complication, persistent fever, or persistent bacteremia in the repeated plug culture development of heart failure, abscess, or AV block, and transesophageal is recommended when the patient is stable before switching from IV to oral antibiotic therapy, as we are going to speak in the treatment of infective endocarditis, and during the follow-up, the repeat echo, whether transthoracic or transesophageal, should be considered 
to detect new silent complication even if the patient is uncomplicated and as we mentioned the timing and mode depends on the initial finding type of microorganism and the initial response to therapy the intraoperative echo is essential of course during surgery because sometimes it may add additional finding and the follow-up after completion of therapy is essential for evaluation of cardiac and valve morphology and function in patients with infective endocarditis who were kept on the conservative treatment without surgery to make sure that the patient had complete resolution of the infection. Is there any rule for other imaging modalities besides echo? Of course, the answer is yes. First of all, CT scan. Why do we need CT scan? It helps us in diagnosis of infective endocarditis and cardiac complication because it is more accurate than the transesophageal echo to diagnose perivalvular and periprostatic complication. And so it is recommended in both native and prostatic valve if the transesophageal is not conclusive or not feasible. However, echo is still superior to detect valvular lesion and small vegetation less than 10 millimeter and to detect leaflet perforation, which may not be diagnosed sufficiently by CT. Also, it helps us to detect distant embolic lesion, like the whole body or the brain CT are useful to assess systemic complication like septic emboli and adding a minor diagnostic criterion to confirm diagnosis. CT cerebral angiography can detect mycotic arterial aneurysms, which is considered an embolic complication because it is the emboli lodged in the vasa vasura of the cerebral arteries which may rupture resulting in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Of course, we know that MRI is superior to CT to diagnose neurological complication, but still CT is more feasible in the emergency setting with good sensitivity and specificity to diagnose ischemic and hemorrhagic lesions. Also, it helps us to detect sources of bacteremia that may be the cause of the infection in the heart. For example, it can detect extracardiac sources of bacteremia like early neoplastic lesion, but in this case, we would need the specific test to confirm the source. For example, if we discovered that there is a clonic neoplasm, so we would need colonoscopy to confirm or exclude colon cancer. Also in preoperative assessment, for example, in patients with aortic valve endocarditis, if we need preoperative coronary angiography, it may be dangerous because it may induce coronary embolism with the catheter. So in this case, I may arrange for CT coronary angiography to exclude coronary artery disease, and it may detect alternative diagnosis if the rule of infective endocarditis is excluded or in doubtful patient with possible infective endocarditis, it may show another alternative septic focus. What about MRI? Is it essential? Yes, sometimes it may help to confirm the diagnosis of infective endocarditis and show the cardiac complication. But remember that its role to diagnose is limited by the low special resolution as compared with cardiac CT, especially in processes is sometimes the artifacts from the prostatic valve may impair its assessment. But it has an essential role in the diagnosis of neurological complication because it has higher sensitivity than CT to diagnose hemorrhagic or ischemic lesion, adding a minor diagnostic criterion. But note that the cerebral microbleeds should not be considered a minor criterion because they are not correlated with ischemic lesion or with the infective endocarditis, so they should not be added to the diagnostic criteria. MRI also is essential to diagnose a spine lesion, like in case of spondylodiscitis, one of the famous embolic complications from infective endocarditis or vertebral osteomyelitis with a high diagnostic accuracy, and it can assess the vertebrae, disc edema, paravertebral or epidural inflammation or abscess, bone erosion or gadolinium enhancement of the vertebrae and disc. The nuclear imaging has resulted in a revolution in the diagnosis of infective endocarditis and its complication because either the fluorodeoxyglucose PET-CT or the white blood cell single photon emission computed tomography famously known as SPECT-CT are recommended in case of suspected prostatic valve in case of inconclusive echocardiography and the most recent meta-analysis showed a high sensitivity and specificity for the PET-CT in prostatic valve endocarditis because sometimes the echo or CT are inconclusive. But remember that its sensitivity in native valve endocarditis is lower with higher 
specificity because sometimes the valve vegetation that are more frequently present in native valve in comparison with the paravalvular involvement sometimes they may not be detected with reduced inflammatory response and so lower uptake of fluority oxyglucose in the PET CT or wild blood cell uptake in the SPECT CT. So, diagnosis of infective endocarditis cannot be excluded in absence of abnormal fluorodeoxyglucose uptake because sometimes there are false negative results. Nuclear imaging can detect distant lesion and also the sources of bacteremia because the whole body imaging here in case of suspected or definite infective endocarditis can detect any septic emboli, for example located in the lungs, spleen, kidneys or liver intervertebral disc or the vertebrae themselves, muscles or joints. However, PET-CT is not suitable to detect cerebral septic emboli or mycotic aneurysm due to the high physiological uptake of the fluorodeoxyglucose in the brain. In this case, you may need to have CT or MRI or MRA, but nuclear imaging is essential for whole scanning and detecting any hot spots inside the body except for the brain. So the recommendation for these imaging modalities that cardiac CT is recommended in patients with possible native valve endocarditis to detect valvular regions and confirm the diagnosis. PET CT and cardiac CT are recommended in possible prostatic valve endocarditis to detect valvular regions and confirm the diagnosis. Cardiac CT is recommended in native and prostatic valve endocarditis to diagnose paravalvular or periprostatic complication if echo is inconclusive, brain and whole body imaging are recommended in symptomatic patient with native and prosthetic valve endocarditis to detect any peripheral lesions and add minor diagnostic criteria. So there is a class one recommendation to perform whole body imaging either by CT, MRI or PET CT to detect the embolic complication but in symptomatic patients. SPECT CT should be considered as a class 2A in patients with high clinical suspicion of prostatic valve endocarditis when the echo is negative or inconclusive and PET CT is unavailable. So the recommendation for the CT scan or the PET CT are class 1 in patients with suspected prostatic valve endocarditis, but it is just class 2A for the SPECT CT. And the fluorodeoxyglucose PET CT may be considered in possible cardiac device related infective endocarditis. And the brain and whole body imaging, which had a class 1 recommendation for symptomatic patient to detect embolic complication. But in this case, if the patient is asymptomatic, native or prostatic valve endocarditis, just a class 2B to detect any silent peripheral lesions. Of course, the cardiologist alone cannot decide on these imaging techniques whether to ask for them or no need for them. And also, the plan of treatment is not decided by him alone, by the endocarditis team in a heart valve center, which have its core members, which are the cardiologist, cardiac imaging expert, cardiovascular surgeon, infectious disease specialist, microbiologist for the blood culture results, and specialist in outpatient parenteral antibiotic treatment, besides radiologist, pharmacologist, neurologist, nephrologist, anesthesiologist, critical care, geriatrician, social workers, nurses, and pathologists. And so there are specific recommendations for the endocarditis team that the diagnosis and management of patients with complicated infective endocarditis are recommended to be performed in a heart valve center with immediate surgical facilities if the patient needed emergent or urgent surgery and so the endocarditis team here is important for synergistic treatments for patients with uncomplicated infective endocarditis they could be managed in a referring center but the center should have regular communication with a heart valve center and with the heart endocarditis team in order to improve the outcomes of this patient so let's summarize what are the 2023 modified diagnostic criteria to be used to diagnose infective endocarditis. The major criteria has two major groups, either the plaque cultures which are positive for infective endocarditis, for example, a typical microorganism which is consistent to be causing infective endocarditis from two separate plaque culture like oral streptococci, streptococcus gallaloticus formerly known as strep bovis, has a group staph aureus or enterococcus fecalis.
or microorganism consistent with infective endocarditis, not one of these mentioned above, from continuously positive plaque culture, either two or more positive plaque cultures of blood sample drawn more than 12 hours apart, or all of three cultures, or four or more cultures, the majority of them show this organism with the first and last sample drawn more than one hour apart or a single positive plaque culture for coxiella pernitae or IgG antibody tetra more than 1 over 800. Any one of them present in the patient is considered a major criterion. The second group regarding the imaging positive for infective endocarditis showing valvular, perivalvular or periprosthetic complication or metabolic lesion shown by nuclear imaging characteristic of infective endocarditis by any of the following imaging technique transrosic, transophageal echo, cardiac CT, PET CT, or SPECT CT. Any one of them is considered positive for infective endocarditis and so a major criterion. The minor criteria include presence of a predisposing condition, either putting the patient at high or intermediate risk for infective endocarditis or people who inject drugs are considered a minor criterion. Presence of a persistent fever as temperature more than 38 degrees. Presence of any embolic complication even if the patient is asymptomatic and it was discovered accidentally by imaging only, like any systemic or pulmonary emboli, infarcts or abscess. Presence of osteoarticular septic complication like spondylodiscitis, mycotic aneurysm, ischemic or hemorrhagic lesion in the brain, conjunctival hemorrhage, Janeway lesion in the palm, presence of immunological phenomena like glomerular nephritis, ocular nodes or ROS spots, and positive rheumatoid factor, or microbiological evidence like positive plaque culture but not fulfilling a major criterion as mentioned above, or serological evidence of active infection with an organism consistent with infective endocarditis in this case it is considered a minor criterion so after you collect these criteria through your clinical assessment what would you consider this patient is for example if the patient is having two major criteria or one major and three minor criteria at least or five minor criteria in this case it is a definite case of infective endocarditis if the patient is having just one major criteria with one or two minor criteria or three to four minor criteria, not five, as mentioned above. In this case, it is a possible infective endocarditis. It may be yes, it may be no, and we would need further investigations. But if the patient is not meeting any criteria for definite or possible infective endocarditis at admission, with or without another alternative diagnosis, this is a rejected diagnosis of infective endocarditis. This diagram shows us how to deal with the diagnosis of a suspected case of native valve infective endocarditis. First of all, you perform baseline assessment including clinical presentation, asking for plaque culture, transthoracic and transphagial echo. Then use the modified 2023 diagnostic criteria. If the patient has a definite diagnosis because he has two major criteria, one major and three minor or five minor criteria, so it is a definite case of infective endocarditis, so you need to look for the complication for risk stratification, like suspected paravalvular complication if the TEE is inconclusive, so ask for cardiac CT, symptoms suggesting extra cardiac complications, so there is a class 1 recommendation for brain and whole body imaging by the CT, PET CT or MRI or no symptoms to suggest extra cardiac complications to just the class 2B that you may need to have brain and whole body imaging to detect silent complications. If the patient was having possible diagnosis like one major and two minor or three or four minor criteria, so it is a possible case of infective endocarditis. So you need to repeat the plaque cultures if they were negative or doubtful, repeat the echo within five to seven days if the first echo was normal, and arrange for cardiac CT because sometimes they may be more sensitive to detect valvular lesions, and add minor criteria via brain or whole body imaging to detect any distant embolic lesion. Otherwise, the patient has a rejected diagnosis of infective endocarditis if it is not meeting any criteria for the definite or possible infective endocarditis.
The same steps apply for suspected prosthetic valve endocarditis. The only difference that in case of possible infective endocarditis, you can arrange for cardiac CT or PET CT from the start to diagnose periprosthetic complication, or if they are not available, arrange for SPECT CT to detect any valvular lesions that may help you to confirm your diagnosis because they add more information than the native valve endocarditis. The last topic to be discussed today in our video is that what are the predictors of poor prognosis? Not to get in despair that the patient will not recover, but to be more meticulous in your assessment and follow up this patient and this patient need to be admitted in a heart valve center and he may need urgent surgery. So there are factors related to the patient, clinical complication, to the microbiology or the echo features. Let's start with the patient characteristics, for example, older age, presence of prosthetic valve endocarditis in comparison to the native valve endocarditis, patient on regular hemodialysis, unsuitable for surgery due to frailty, diabetes mellitus, or high Charlison comorbidity index, all of these put the patient at a higher risk. Presence of clinical complication like heart failure, which is the most common complication and the most common indication for surgery, cerebral complication, either ischemic lesion or intracranial hemorrhage, presence of septic shock as a complication of the persistent unresolving infection or renal failure, or these worsen the prognosis and need a decision by the endocarditis team. Microbiological features like the staph aureus, a very virulent bacteria that result in a large vegetation, high incidence for cerebral embolism, and high incidence of perivalvular extension, fungi which usually don't respond to the usual antifungal treatment and the patient as the end need surgery. non hasic gram-negative bacilli of course have worse prognosis and poor response in comparison to the hasic group and persistent bacteremia in the repeat plaque cultures. And the last group are the echocardiographic features like periannular complication, for example, abscess antihasins, left-sided in comparison to right-sided infective endocarditis due to incidence of systemic embolism, especially cerebral embolism, vegetation size more than 10 mm, which increase risk of embolic complication and perivalvular extension, severe left-sided regurgitation plus minus reduced LV ejection fraction worsens the prognosis and increase the incidence of heart failure, which is the most common indication for surgery, presence of pulmonary hypertension either as a result or pre-existing before the infection, prosthetic valve dysfunction, which may result in a stuck valve resulting in cardiogenic shock or pulmonary edema needing emergent surgery within less than 24 hours, or severe diastolic dysfunction or elevated LV and diastolic pressure, all of these indicate drastic damage to the heart that may need urgent or emergent surgery to correct these lesions. So we have reached the end of our video today and our take home message that the diagnosis of infective endocarditis is a matter of clinical suspicion. You are looking for a predisposed patient with suggestive symptoms, so of course, you suspect infective endocarditis, but beside your clinical judgment, use the modified diagnostic criteria to decide on the next step, whether we are going to start the appropriate treatment because the patient has definite infective endocarditis, or you are going to ask for other investigations because it's still possible diagnosis that I need to confirm. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for the treatment of infective endocarditis.